Okay, so I think we'll begin. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient and Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Today's program is part of a MJHFC parenting series, which is a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General Hospital for Children. Before we begin, I wanted to go over a few items with you all. Please note today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing a recording of today's session, you can visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note everyone is in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted to reduce any feedback so that we can hear today's guest speaker. If you have any questions, please use the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen. We will have questions, we'll have time for them at the end. Only Blum Center staff, the co-host and guest speaker will be able to see them. Please do not share any personal medical question or information in the chat box. If you have any questions that's medical, please ask a doctor. Next, I would like to introduce you all to Brianna Beckbull. She is the project manager and editor for Mass General Hospital for Children, and she will introduce you all to today's guest speaker. Great, thank you, Amy. So good afternoon. I hope you're all doing well, and thank you for coming to this virtual session of the MGHFC Parenting Series, where experts share their knowledge with patients, family, and staff on various pediatric health topics. This year, we're co-hosting the series with the Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General, and my name is Brianna Beckbold. I'm our project manager and editor at Mass General Hospital for Children, which is the pediatric branch of Mass General. And today we have Dr. Jean Berezin from the child, from a, excuse me, child and adolescent psychology um, and the Clay Center for Young Healthy Minds at Mass General. He's going to share ways to support your child and family's mental health throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. So before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Berezin is the Executive Director of the Clay Center for Young Healthy Minds at Mass General and a Senior Educator in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Mass General Hospital for Children. As a clinician and educator with 40 years of experience uh, in working with youth, Dr. Berezin has focused on prevention, early intervention, and treatment of teens and young adults. He's been a keynote speaker at local and international conferences, and he's often called upon by news media to weigh in on issues relevant to this vulnerable, pop vulnerable population and the unique impact of societal issues. In addition to his current role at the Clay Center, Dr. Berezin also directs the Elizabeth Thatcher Acampora Endowment, an outreach program to meet the needs of underserved youth and families in three community settings. Dr. Berezin will present until around 12.45, at which point we will take questions from the audience in the chat box. So from here, I will hand it off to Dr. Berezin. Thanks a lot. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Let me pull up my slides. Okay. One second. Okay, can you see this? Can everybody see this? We're okay? All right. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to, to, to talk with you today, and I'll try to get through a lot of material. and We'll have time for questions. So what I want to focus on is, is um, coping during this pandemic. Um, we're certainly not out of the woods, and some tools for um, promoting mental health in, in children. Now, um, Kids of all ages have three major questions. Am I safe? Are you the people caring for me safe? And how is this going to affect my, my daily life? And parents have two basic questions. Um, uh, and this is also grandparents and caregivers of all kinds. I might add teachers and anyone who deals with youth. Um, and that is when to worry and when not to worry. And that is when to worry about source about sources of stress and anxiety and depression, what to look for, and then what to do. Um, uh, so what do we do when we see things that are kind of worrisome? So when to worry. Uh, the most important thing to begin with is to think developmentally. And so for preschool kids, what we're uh, what we we may see um, uh, is irritability, clinging behavior, regression. So they might be of newly afraid of separating they might uh what they might wet themselves they may wet the bed they may be moody they may have trouble going to sleep they can have tantrums for school-age kids 
uh, problems with attention, sleep problems. They also can be moody. Uh, many school-aged children, and when I say school-aged children, I mean K through, say, sixth grade. Um, they may have somatic or physical complaints, such as headaches, stomach aches, chest pain. Uh, they may be uh, reduced in their verbal responsiveness, or they may ask questions over and over and over again. Uh, they're worried. School-age kids think in black and white terms, you know, life and death and good and bad. And so they, they, want, they want reassurance, they want structure, um, and, and they also want to know that, that things are going to be okay. Um, the other thing that we have to be thinking about with school-age kids, and we'll see even more so with teenagers, is that this is a period of huge loss. Um, kids have lost their friends, they've lost being included in activities, sports, social interactions, playing with peers. Uh, so they're, they're upset about that, for sure. Now, teenagers, uh, they're more aware and of the dangers of COVID. They're more aware of the dangers to themselves. Um, uh, uh, they may present with irritability, depression, anger, distractibility. They may be withdrawn. One thing to, to think about as a parent is that, you know, you're the expert on your kid. And if you see a change in behavior of any kind that really seems different, that's that's the time to worry. Now, is it is it a serious worry or is it just a little bit of a phase? We won't know, but but we ha we need to find out. Teenagers, you know, this is a period where they're separating from family, where they're looking for more autonomy, where they want to be free, where they want to go hang out with their friends. Those that are driving want to, gonna, you know, you know, tool around in their car, in your car, generally. Um, they've lost that. Uh, they've lost major events. I mean, last spring, there were no graduations. There was no prom. There weren't, there weren't finals in sports. And this year, sporting events have been canceled. So imagine how difficult it is for uh, them to have lost all of these major events in their lives. Um, many are planning to go to college. They don't know when or how or if they're gonna do that. And those who are not going to college, um, how do they look for jobs? Um, so they, they've lost a lot uh, and they're acutely aware of that. Uh, and there's also um, this thing that's called anticipatory grief. So teenagers are able to kind of look into the future more than younger kids. And they're worried. What is this going to mean in terms of future prospects for jobs, internships for next year, um, for loved ones who may get ill? They know that there's a second surge going on right now, and they're worried about, about their parents and their grandparents. So here's a depressed teenager. Now, what to do? Uh, first and foremost, uh, all the research, all the clinical information we have says that as a parent, as a grandparent, as a teacher, as a caregiver, uh, as a healthcare provider, you cannot provide any kind of assistance or help unless you control your own anxiety. So what can we do as parents to control anxiety? And as you see, here's the flight attendant. Uh, and as we know, in the airplane, for those of us who were flying, or may still be flying, um, if the pressure drops, put the life mask put the oxygen mask on yourself first and then help the person next to you, well, we need to put our oxygen masks on and that means controlling our anxiety. And there's some tips here. Get information, but don't flood yourself. T talk with others. I'm gonna repeat this over and over again. Kids as well as adults uh, are social creatures. We really get a lot of relief by connecting with others. Carve some time out for yourself. Don't expect yourself to be able to do everything. I mean, right now, you know, when this when this all began, many of us, myself included, thought this was going to be like one snow day. Gosh, I'm going to have a lot of time, you know, time to do other things, time to do fun things, time to have. We're doing more than ever before. Because not only are we working remotely or having to go in if we're essential workers, we're maintaining the household. We're taking care of our kids. We're le we're learning about their schedules. We're dealing with uh, uh, information, uh, as well as social issues, which we'll talk about. So um, don't overload yourself. Set your priorities. Get yourself out of the house. And the last point is really important. You know, if your kids your kids know that you're upset or anxious. If they ask you, be honest with them because there's if you if you lie to them, they know that you're hiding something, and everybody 
when you're hiding things, thinks the worst. So be honest and, and, and tell them that you're worried. And you don't necessarily have to tell them all the details about your worries, but you can say, sure, I'm worried too. So in terms of parental self-care, um, diet, exercise, getting a good amount of sleep, uh, and using techniques such as meditation, yoga, relaxation of any kind, reading a book, listening to music, whatever works for you, uh, help yourself stay relaxed and, and as much as you can and relieve anxiety. Now, for kids of all ages, ask, and then I'll come to certain developmental uh, uh, appropriate uh, questions for kids of certain ages. Ask what they know. We can't reassure them or give them guidance unless you know, how did you learn about the COVID virus? What do you know about it? What are you worried about? What are your concerns? Where did you hear about it? And validate their feelings and concerns. You know, I mean, if they're worried that the dog is going to get it and die, you can say, you know, dogs don't get COVID. And you don't have to worry about that. And if they're worried about say, well, I'm worried that grandma might be getting it and she's in a nursing home, then you can say, well, you know, they're getting the vaccines first. Uh, they're getting the best of care. And um, the people that are helping her are doing the best they can, so you can reassure them. So you really need to know what they're thinking about. Don't just assume you know what they're thinking about. Be available for frequent conversations for the kids of all ages. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And kids, especially school-age kids, will ask you questions over and over again. Um, and that's just fine. They need to hear things repeatedly. And as you can see, this mom and this little girl in a mask, empower them by modeling good behavior, hand washing, masks, social distancing. They are watching us and, they, and we need to model the right stuff for them. Providing reassurance. You know, uh, we're all tied to family narratives. So for example, you could say, you know, remember when the tree fell on the house during the hurricane and we got through. Remember when we lost power. Remember when that big snowstorm happened. Remember when, when the when the pipes burst in the basement and things got flooded, there are so many stories of difficulties that families have. Kids can respond to that by seeing that we've been through hard times and we can get through them again. Structure, structure, structure. I would structure your households seven days a week as if this were school. So there are times for getting up. There's times for breakfast, lunch, dinner schoolwork, um, uh, relaxation time, screen time, uh, whatever. But, but build a structure and you, know, you can even write it out on a whiteboard or on the refrigerator. Uh, there's no better way of supporting your kids than using creative arts. Um, we, we all use creative arts, but especially children. So whether this is journaling or drawing or writing music or, um, or uh, writing stories, um, encourage them to use creative arts. This is a time I would encourage screen time. Now, we're, there's a lot of debate about how much screen time kids should or shouldn't have, but when screen time is used now, I mean, remember, kids are isolated from their peers, and this is the time when, they, when screen time is going to be very important for them to connect with their friends uh, and, uh, and other family members, and I would, I would allow um, a, a liberal amount of that. And there's also self-care for teens, which is not all that different from adults. Um, meditate with them, do yoga with them, um, listen to music with them. Uh, and uh, we all can use a bit of, of self-care. Now, what to do specifically with kids at different ages? So preschool kids. Now, preschool kids um, uh, are going to respond more to your emotions than to anything else. They're not advanced enough to know, understand what COVID is, what a virus is. Uh, so they don't need to hear that kind of stuff. What they need to do is know that you're available, and that means more TLC. Cuddle with them, play with them. They may need to sleep in your room. They may want to sleep in your room. That's fine. A really important point for preschoolers and for school-age kids is to turn off the media. Um, look, they have no idea um, uh, what a pandemic is. They have no idea when they say thousands are, 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 are dying uh, and, and we're losing our hospital beds and, 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 they list a, and they list San Diego or they list California. They have no idea 
where California is compared to Boston. So um, turn the media off for them. And watch your conversations because they're listening. School-age kids. Um, as I said, they school-age kids have black and white thinking. And so they need concrete explanations. Uh, they need reassurance. They also need structure, um, uh, probably more than kids of other ages. Uh, don't worry about, as I said, don't worry about repeated questions. And they work things through with play. So if they play frontline workers, doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, helping to save people's lives over and over and over again, you might think that that's going to be increasing their anxiety. It actually reduces their anxiety because they're working through things over and over again by playing. And again, as I said, turn off the media, too much information. Now, teenagers are much more advanced and they are capable of more nuanced conversations. They understand about, they understand more about the virus. They understand more about what they're seeing on the media. And they are watching media through their smartphone, their tablets, their computers, their televisions, the radio. So one of the things we want to do with the teenagers is watch what they're watching and then have conversations with them. What do you think that means? What worries you about that? What are your concerns? Um, how do you think we can solve that problem? Get Stimulate them to be thinking and talking with you and having these conversations um, because it's very important for them to be involved and for them to be able to turn to you to ask you questions. Um, again, as I said before, this is not the time to limit screen time necessarily uh, because they're really, really lonely. Another and important thing for teenagers, but for kids of all ages, is making contributions. You know, our brains are wired so that we get more out of giving than receiving. You know, it may seem that our kids want this, 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 and this, but actually when they contribute, it fires oxytocin. And oxytocin is that chemical in the brain that brings us closer together. So having them make a contribution, whether that's sending cards or whether that's um, uh, helping to deliver a meal to um, a local nursing home or a church or a community center um, uh, is very, very helpful for, for, for teenagers. Now, one other thing we need to be thinking about, and that is, is that this pandemic doesn't occur in a vacuum. Um, um, it's been a perfect storm. Uh, and as we've seen from last Wednesday, the storm grew even greater. I'm not going to talk about that, but but it, it occurs within a context. So why is this a perfect storm? Well, teens and young adults are more stressed, anxious, and depressed, and lonely today than ever before, really. Uh, in fact, they are the most stressed and lonely of any part of our generation, and that is the Gen Zs and the, middle, and the Millennials. Um, why this is, nobody really knows. Suicide rates have been increasing, particularly between the uh, 10 to 14 year olds. No one knows exactly why, uh, but we need to understand that mental health and stress are, uh, are very, very prominent now. And here's my son, Zach, who's now a father of two, uh, but this is when he was, I don't know, maybe four. Um, and I don't know what he was stressed out about, but what are the stress factors? Uncertainty, loss and grief, transitions, especially to a new school. You know, I think I think that the transitions are especially hard for kids who are going from um, from, uh, uh, you know, into middle school or kids who are going into high school or kids who are transitioning to college. Those transition periods are extremely difficult now. It's especially hard for kids who have uh, learning problems and uh, developmental problems. Um, uh, parents um, who are not at home to support their kids through remote learning um, makes it very difficult. And there are lots and lots of disparities. You know, largely they're socioeconomically based, such as food insecurity, lack of internet. You know, did you, did you know that 16% of Boston doesn't have internet? So if, if schools shut down, even for a day or two, and kids are supposed to be working at home and they don't have internet, I mean, that puts a huge amount of pressure on them and on the parents. Um, lack of proficiency in English. I mean, plenty of our, our, our families in, in, in the area don't, don't speak English as a first language. So there are lots and lots of stresses. Um, 
There's also the lack of contact with coaches, mentors, teachers. You know, our kids turn to others um, a lot, sometimes more than they turn to us as parents. And um, those folks are not as accessible as they had been before. Now, social media has been cited as the most common reason for all of these mental health problems, but I think it's much more than that. And remember that our teenagers, especially, have been involved in hashtag me too, hashtag never again, uh, climate change, the economic downturn. All of this began before COVID, before the pandemic, um, and they're still concerned about these things. Uh, they're still actively engaged uh, through social media around these things, and it adds to their to their stress. Now, many are worried about um, the loss of social emotional learning. The good news is is that we're finally coming to realize that social emotional learning is really important. It's huge. And I think one of the best organizations involved for this, which you can check out, is the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, or CASEL. And if you notice on this, on this uh, slide, there are a number of areas that are involved in social emotional learning. Self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, social awareness, self-awareness. And as you can see from the diagram, they're embodied in classrooms, in schools and within homes and communities. So they're layers and they're partnerships. And one of the things that many are worried about is that our kids are going to be losing these opportunities. I'll get to the loss issue in a, in a minute. Don't worry because even if they're missing something now, they'll pick it up later. But what I do want to focus on now is this issue of loneliness. There have been a number of studies to show that the Gen Z and the Millennials are the loneliest generation ever and the loneliest of all segments of the population. This is true not just in the United States, but uh, the BBC did a very extensive study about this. So um, we don't know why this generation has been so is so lonely. Um, many attribute it to the excessive use of, of digital media, but I think that's a very simplistic answer. Um, there, there's a lot of reasons we can talk about, but when you combine the fact that we have generation, a generation of young people who are lonely and you combine that with grief and loss, we get into a real problem. Um, and, and there are a lot of consequences to loneliness. You know, the emotional fallout is depression and an increased risk of suicidal thinking, poor sleep and the consequences of sleep deprivation inability to self-regulate. I mean, you know, when, when, when kids as well as adults are lonely, we turn to quick fixes and that means eating, smoking, uh, substance use. Um, that's not a solution to loneliness, but it's, it's something that we have to look for. Uh, and there's also problems that are physiological, like a weakened immune system. So how do we keep up with social emotional learning? Now, we can do this at home. Uh, we can foster family activities. You know, a number of, of families that I've spoken to said they've never spent more time with their kids. They've never had more meals together. They've never had more opportunity for conversations. So make use of it. And even though it's remote, you can your kid, you and your kids can go online and join in your clubs, spiritual groups, and activities remotely. Um, I, I think we should encourage for routine check-ins with teachers because oftentimes we count on teachers as um, outside observers of our kids, uh, particularly around their mental health, and have them do check-ins. I mentioned online contact with friends, um, social activities. You know, more kids are playing Dungeons and Dragons now, and adults, than ever before. So what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, playing games online, joining groups, um, I, I, there are plenty of groups that kids can join um, that are really cool and that, uh, and that can help them combat the loneliness. Another tool in your toolbox is what's called cognitive behavior therapy, and I'll tell you something about it in a nutshell. CBT, um, here's the model. So you have a trigger, and let's say the trigger is... Um, oh, uh, I'm not going to play on the varsity sport this year. Mom is a senior in high school. 
So that's the trigger. The cognition is my life is ruined. I'll never get into college. Uh, the emotion is despair and the behavior is withdrawal, withdrawn. Um, so let's, let's take this. So what research has shown is that a way of changing the emotions and the behavior is by bringing down catastrophic, dramatic, exaggerated thinking to a, a, a reasonable level. Now, it is true that the season's canceled. So what I say to uh, folks, whether it's a, a kid or an adult, um, or you can do it together, is imagine two lawyers, one on each shoulder, as you see on your lower left, or imagine a devil and angel, one on each shoulder, and one lawyer or devil says, your life is, my life is ruined. And the other one says, wait a second, but everybody's out of sports this year. We're all in the same boat. I'll, I'll get into college. You know, besides, my GPA is okay. Nah, it's ruined. It's ruined. I'm telling you, it's ruined because you know that that was your ticket. The other one says, wait a second. There are plenty of tickets to college. So you can see how you go back and forth and back. And forth. It actually can be fun um, and, and entertaining. Um, and it can be done alone or between two people. But... And it seems so simple, and it, it actually is, to use a debate, an argument to kind of bring down. And what happens is, is that as the exaggerated thoughts come down to a low roar, it doesn't change the reality of the situation. But as the thinking comes down to a reasonable level, the emotions improve and the behavior changes. So consider practicing CBT, and you, it, it's not rocket science. You don't have to be a trained psychologist or psychiatrist to, to practice CBT. Some other tips. This is a time for us to appreciate what we've taken for granted. You know, never have, have we learned how much, how important it is to be able to hug each other, you know, to spend, to, to be in the same house together. Um, so, you know, that's a take home message. Um, we're all on this together. And so we can learn how vital support is. And I would address this with your kids. We're all stressed. And again, share your stories. You know, I remember my mom who died uh, a, a couple years ago at almost 102, uh, would tell stories about the Great Depression and World War II and how she uh, didn't have enough money to get into to, to college so that she, she, she was a pianist and she played the piano in department stores. My kids still tell stories of their grandma uh, and, and her trials and tribulations during the Great Depression and World War II. We all have family stories, so share them. Peer activities and organized activities are really important. Um, and um, as I said, be creative and contribute to your community. And you can see here in the shots on the left of the post 9-11 contributions and on the right the Boston Marathon kids want to contribute they want to do things they want to add they want to they want to make they want to feel that they're a part of the solution and not just a part of a problem so new worries and that is development is arrested well the good news wait a second let me go back okay the good news is, okay, so on the left, you see the brain with its 100 billion neurons, each with 10,000 connections. That is more than I can conceive of. The good news about the complexity of our brain, and on the right, you see my grandson, Jude, and his sister, Remy, um, Zach, the one who was in the wicker chair screaming, that's his dad, who's now, uh, you know, in his 30s. Um, there is always room to catch up and have a second chance. The good news about our brain is that we can always capture what we, what seems to be lost. Don't think of it as lost or as lost forever. Think of it as a gap, because develop the, the cool thing about being human is that we can make up what we've missed. We're resilient, and there's always room to catch up. And how do we do this? Well, first of all, collaborate with your uh, with your family members, with your teachers, with your friends, and monitor your kids' development. See what they're what what they're losing ground on. Offer opportunities in real time to make up things that they that they may fall be falling behind on academically, socially, emotionally, behaviorally. Um, 
family stability is really critical at this time. And that is read together, do arts together, have conversations, play games, uh, make connections. But please don't worry that what they're missing in remote learning is going to be lost forever. It's not. And you know something? The last thing I worry about is time because we're all so immersed in feeling that we have to get things done quickly or we're going to lose it forever. And that's just not true. Now, what about managing back to school anxiety? Because that's what all of my patients and my kids and grandchildren are worried about. First of all, get information and keep in touch with your schools. Explain to your kids that, you know, while we're all eager to get back to business as usual in school, and you know, it's, it's funny, you know, two years ago, kids complained about school. Now they're eager to get back to school. So they, they, they don't realize what they've missed. I wouldn't remind them that because that's kind of like shaming them necessarily in, in a way. But, but, but explain for them that the, right now we need to be safe. But they will get back to their peers um, at some, and, their, and their school activities again. Um, but I would worry, I would, I, would want, I would ask them what they're worried about and what their concerns are and remind them that things change, that things change day by day. Uh, and keep them informed about the changes, just as you need to be informed about the changes in your school uh, and in your and in your community. And finally, and then we'll have time for some questions. Um, uh, and that is uh, a lot of time for questions. Um, don't worry alone. Now, this is Zach on the left, who who's the dad to those two kids you just saw and his twin sister, uh, Glennon, on the right, who's got a, Sasha is, oh, about uh, three and a half, and her infant Casey is six months. She had Casey during, um, during May, uh, when she, at Mass General, she had during COVID. Um, uh, but they're twins, and the cool thing about them as twins and the cool thing about that for all of us is don't worry alone. Share your concerns, share your worries with others. Now, there are a number of resources that I want to mention for you. Uh, at the Clay Center, we have um, a coronavirus and family mental health page uh, that's translated into Spanish as well as English. Um, and there are a number of articles, and you can get this uh, at, the, at the Clay uh, website. At the MGH, uh, we have Managing Back to School Anxiety on the Mass General Hospital uh, webpage. And um, at the, uh, the Clay Center's webpage, um, and we also have a YouTube channel, which has a number of uh, videos. In fact, there's some videos on self-care for um, uh, school-age kids, middle school kids, and uh, college-age kids uh, and young adults. Um, uh, that's uh, MGH Clay Center. If you just go to YouTube, MGH Clay Center, you'll get to it. So you can see we have some of these articles that can support some of the stuff that I've said, how to support your kids during the pandemic, how do you cope with situational anxiety, uh, coping through grief and loss, um, and, and the self-care videos. And they're all readily available uh, by going to the MGH uh, Clay Center's website. The other thing is, is that the Department of Psychiatry has just an amazing uh, COVID-19 webpage. Um, it is just spectacular. And only one section of it has to do with, uh, with family, uh, with matters for families and kids. The rest of it has just about everything you ever wanted to know or were afraid to ask about, about COVID. Uh, and it's really kept up to date. So, um, uh, it's a really great resource for you to turn to through our Department of Psychiatry. And, and as this, uh, this slide will be available for everybody. Now I've kind of zipped through this whole thing. That's my final slide. So I will stop sharing the screen because I wanted to, I wanted to save a lot of time for questions and answers because you probably have quite a few. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen and yep. let's... I I can uh, read the questions for everyone and then uh, Dr. Barrison, you can answer them. Um, so our first question is, how do we support our kids when they get pressure from school and teachers to 
complete assignments and make up work they didn't complete when they were uh, in full breakdown mode. My daughter worries about her grades more than I do, so this pressure has significant impact on her mental health. Okay, great question. Um, well, there's, and I'll answer it in two ways. First of all, um, you have to help her alleviate her anxiety. I can tell you, a lot of my patients um, and uh, grandchildren um, uh, worry about their their grades. And I think um, to let them know that um, grades are only one part of the way you're going to be evaluated. Um, and frankly, and again, I use narratives. I tell them, you know, are you worried about, you know, for teenagers, for example, are you worried about your SATs? Are you worried about your PSATs? Are you worried about your standardized tests? Are you worried about your MCAS? Well, guess what? I'm the worst test taker that ever lived, ever. Uh, my, S my SATs were way low. My MCAT, the, the test I had to take for medical school, were way low. But I had other things that made me an appealing person for whatever I was applying for. So just remember that grades are um, only one element in how you're being evaluated, number one. Number two, during the COVID period, um, people who are evaluating you, whether it's colleges or whether it's um, internships or, or other jobs that you're applying for, they know that this is a tough time and they, they take that into account. So you need to reassure them. The other thing though is, I think it merits a conversation with teachers because frankly, teachers need to be our allies on this and kids listen to their teachers. And for the kid, for the teachers to be able to say, don't worry about your grades or your missed assignments, if the teachers will say that. And if they won't, then it's time to have a conversation with them about what we're actually doing um, and whether or not your school in particular is putting too much pressure on them to get stuff done that they really shouldn't be expected to get done. So, I mean, I'm a strong proponent for uh, having conversations with teachers, with principals, with, with um, headmasters if they go to private school, and talking turkey with them about what kinds of pressures we're putting on our kids and how we have to lighten it up during this time, helping them get their work done, but not necessarily adding insult to injury. Right. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, how do you deal with a high school student whose grades are slipping? Um, getting him to do his work has become a struggle and led to arguments. Um, he is not depressed, but he is lonely. How uh, we worry about mental health. How much do you push normal expectations? Oh, great question. So here's the thing. First of all, um, I would refer you to um, a, a program uh, at Mass General called Think Kids. It's called Collaborative Problem Solving. Um, and um, if you have a chance, take a look at Stuart Ablon's TEDx talk. Um, and when I and, and this is a model that says um, there are certain things that are non-negotiable, and that is, you know, danger. Like you're not going to let a kid run out into the street. Then there's certain things that are that are not worth fighting about. And then most of our most of our work is to make things a win-win situation. So if your kids if your kids capable of doing the work, but really misses time with his friends, you negotiate with him. You know, as, as Stuart says, um, all kids want approval. All kids want their parents to think highly of them. All kids want to succeed. And a lot of their behavior that we that seems oppositional is not a matter of um, will. It's a matter of lack of skills. So that's the direct quote. Uh, so we negotiate. And that is how much how much time would you like with your friends? And let's build that into your day. And then let's also build in a certain amount of time in your day for you to get your work done. 
So you use, that's just one example of, of, of making, making life into a win-win situation because um, I'm sure your, 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 your kid wants to get the work done, but maybe, maybe lonely, maybe wants to spend more time, maybe wants to spend, maybe wants to play a video game. We can get into that if you want um, with his or her friends. Um, it may not be so bad. However, you know, uh, the winning ticket is we'll, we'll let you have more screen time, but you got to get your work done. So let's see what happens. Now, if, the, if you can negotiate effectively with your kid and collaborate and things get better, great. If not, then it's time to worry and maybe uh, seek a psychological or a professional evaluation because your kid might be might be depressed. Okay, perfect. Um, that's a good lead into our next question, actually. How would a person go about finding an office-based psychologist to help with depression and anxiety? To find, to get what kind of a uh, an office-based psychiatrist? Well, actually, um, so that's navigating the, the mental health system. The good news, the good news about this is, is that, um, is that um, as as much as we've worried about um, the use of Zoom and other platforms for uh, mental health evaluations, um, they're highly effective, they're easily available, and they're covered by insurance freely. So whether you're using Zoom or Team or you name it, um, or Skype, um, uh, they're available. Um, so uh, the first thing to do is to go to your pediatrician and find out how you can get a referral for a clinician. And then uh, your insurance uh, will cover that online. Um, the, the, one of the problems is, is that there are only 8,000 child psychiatrists in the United States. 8,000 for 350 million people, of which about 20 million kids need help. And there are only about 6,000 child psychologists and probably double or triple that amount of social workers. The workforce is low. So one problem might be finding somebody who's available. Um, and what I would do for that is go to your pediatrician first and see who they may uh, help you help get you somebody uh, that's covered by your insurance or see somebody privately. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and if not, go to your insurance company and see who might be available. Just be sure that the match is right. Uh, the good news is, is that we can use uh, these, these online platforms. And in my experience, you know, it, we lose something by not being in the room, but not that much. You know, maybe, maybe 10 or 20 percent. Uh, so um, it, it's hard to find a professional but it can be done, but just go to your PCP first. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question, how do you maintain a balance of having a structured day for preschoolers and having consistency with your expectations while also allowing flexibility to meet them where they are? Oh, what a great question. Well, since I have, I have a couple preschoolers and my <laughs> grandchildren, uh, you know, it depends on your personal situation. If you're an essential worker and you're out of the house, it's really hard. Um, if you're at home, I think what you're going to need to do is uh, structure the day such that you can actually find the time to spend with them and balance that with doing the remote work that you need to do. Um, and that is a balancing act. Um, and um, it means looking over all of the hours of the day, uh, perhaps spending more time with them when they're awake, maybe doing some of your remote uh, work uh, after hours, if that's possible. Um, so it's a matter of reshaping the day. And also, you know, remember as parents, you know when your kids need you the most. There may be certain times a day that they need you more than others, whether that's first thing in the morning or whether that's after they've just gotten up from a nap. Um, but you'll have to structure your day 
based on when they need you the most and try to be flexible with your your uh, remote learning or your remote uh, work situation so that you can actually get some coverage. Another thing to do is to be creative. I mean, that's where we as grandparents can come in. You know, I mean, you know, as much as we may think that it's terrible to plop your kid in front of the screen, if a grandparent or a family member um, or um, an aunt or an uncle can be online with them while you're getting something done, this is the time to, to use that kind of a platform. So, you know, you wouldn't typically want to do that in, you know, if this were in COVID, but we've got to be a bit creative about things. Great. Okay. Um, all right. Do you have any advice for putting structure uh, with a 16 year old girl to do yoga and meditation with her dreaded uncool mother? <laughs> well, she doesn't have to do it with you. Uh, I mean, it, it's first of all, um, uh, again, be creative. If, if, look, whose agenda is it? Is it your agenda to do it with her or is it her agenda to do it with you? Um, if it's really important to do it together, maybe you could make a suggestion like, how about if we get two or three of your friends and two or three of your moms and we're all on Zoom at the same time doing yoga together? I mean, use the media platforms we've got available. Use Zoom for that. Um, uh, and it may not be the best thing for her or for you to do it together. And, you know, um, all of us are taking hits right now. Um, you know, I wouldn't take it as a rejection if your daughter wants to do it with friends more than you. Um, she needs time with her friends. If she's doing yoga online with two or three friends, or and or with a yoga teacher, or or with a um, or at a yoga class, there are plenty of yoga classes online, and you're left out. Uh, that's the hit we have to take as parents. You know, being a parent in my view, particularly with teenagers, equals rejection. <laughs> it's it's not the most fun time to be rejected, but it comes with the territory. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking for some other Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions coming through, but if anyone has additional ones, please put them in. Um, otherwise, it looks like we can wrap up a few minutes early. Are there, are there anything? Are there any? Are there, are there any points that I've missed that, that that you guys would like to ask that that um, that you think is worth uh, pointing out? Right. If you have anything, please put it in the chat box, and I'll read it for Dr. Barrison. Mind if I chime in? Sure. Someone did um, request if you can provide information on that TEDx talk that you mentioned, um, as well as link to the Think Kids information. Yeah, if you if you go to if you Google our best friend, um, sometimes. Uh, by the way, don't Google mental health questions uh, because you never know what's going to be a trusted resource. The reason we started the Clay Center. It's because we wanted to be sure that all of our blogs and podcasts and videos were backed by evidence. Um, and even though they're done in a narrative style, they're evidence-based. Uh, so be careful about going online um, uh, about getting mental health information. You want to go to trusted resources. Um, but if you Google Stuart Ablon, TEDx, you'll get his TEDx talk. And if you like, I can also I can also send a link to uh, to Amy and Brianna um, uh, with with the link if, if if you want to have that. But if you Google it, you'll you'll find it. It's his TEDx talk. Okay. And if and anyone I, wants the um, link, feel free to email the Blum Center email box. We can be reached at pflc <laughs> at partners.org and we'd be happy to share that link with you. Right. 
Okay, we have some things coming through. Um, do you have resources for siblings who are spending a lot of time together during COVID, especially if they're close in age, such as twins? And how do you foster sibling relationships? Well, uh, is there a problem with these siblings? Uh, it doesn't say. <laughs> well, frankly, um, this is the time that siblings can actually make closer and relationships. Um, you know, it may have been in pre-COVID times that the, the only time they, when they got together, they were fighting. They were like snapping at each other. Um, I would, I would welcome them to play games together. To um, well, depending on the differences in ages, the older siblings can read to the younger ones. And by the way, you know, for the question of how uh, you can spend more time with your preschooler, if you have an eleven-year-old and a preschooler, or you know. Uh, even even a five or six year old, they can spend some time together playing, you know, um, now it may need to be supervised out of the corner of your eye. But uh, this is a time when when we can actually, you know, one of the silver linings of COVID is that family relationships uh, can improve and can strengthen and conversations can happen in a better way. Um, now that doesn't mean there won't be conflict. Uh, and, and there are ways of resolving conflict, um, like CBT, uh, like collaborative problem solving. Uh, but it's also a time that we can actually have meals together, that we can cook together, that, you know, we can have siblings uh, playing together, reading stories together, um, God forbid, watching a YouTube video together. Um, creating a playlist you know one of the things my family did um including uh all of my kids um and uh and grandchildren uh, and me and, and my hope you know was to um we had a spotify quarantine playlist and everybody contributed tunes and then we would all have access to share them and listen um so think about creative things you can do together and that the siblings can do together, they can actually be fun, and that actually can go beyond this pandemic and strengthen the relationships. Great. And, yeah. Yeah, that's a creative idea. Um, someone else is asking to address expectations. They're finding that no matter what they do, they cannot expect their children to be at a normal level of happiness and stability. So managing expectations around that. Right. Uh, look, um, I would lower expectations during this period of time. Uh, and I would state that explicitly, you know, if you don't finish your homework, um, you don't want to give them a license to kind of like not do the homework, but if you can't finish it when it's due, you leave a few questions out. If you can't uh, do whatever it is, um, you know, uh, let it go. Again, think about what's most important. Um, there are certain things that we expect all of our kids to do. Be respectful, not call each other names. Um, brush your teeth, you know. Um, uh, so certain things, certain expectations need to be met, but you know, we need to kind of loosen up a little bit during this. Um, and I would make that explicit. I'd say, you know, during this period of time, like, so for example, let's say you've set certain limits on screen time or playing video games um, with other kids, um, whether it's Fortnite or whatever they're into. Um, and they've only been limited to say a half an hour or an hour a day. You might want to actually increase that with the understanding that they're going to, you know, uh, pay that back with some kind of participation. Okay. So, um, as I say to, um, a lot of my patients in family meetings and the kids roll their eyes, you know, there was this philosopher named John Stuart Mill. He was from England and, you know, he was, you know, one of these guys that said, uh, you know, with responsibility comes freedom. The more responsible you are, the more freedom you have. And then there's the eye roll. I said, you know what that means? If you get your work done 
If you do the kinds of things that we're asking you to do, you can have more freedom, more time to do some of the things you want to do. Um, and that's an important message to give to our kids, is that if they're responsible at certain levels, they can have some more freedom. Perfect. Um, so our next question is how to go about structuring days for teenagers to include exercise, fresh air, and healthy eating. Build it in. You know, I mean, like I said, the seven day a week schedule is true for everybody in the family. And if every if, if everyone's schedule, including parents, is posted in some fashion, uh, build it in. Build in time for exercise. Build in time for um, uh, for uh, uh, cooking. Build in time to actually create a menu, to learn a new meal. Uh, build in time uh, for uh, for a lot of these things. Build in time for social for social gatherings with friends. Um, and so, if it's in the schedule. You follow the schedule. And if the kid says, well, geez, I can't follow the schedule because I've got a big homework assignment, then maybe say, okay, well, let's let's add it in over the weekend. So, you know, um, every if everybody has a schedule and there's a certain um, amount of wiggle room, um, I think, you know, we're leveling the playing field. And I, I would let the kids know this is tough for all of us. You know, we have to fit in so many things it's so hard for all of us to do, but you know, diet, exercise, sleep, nutrition, these are all things that are so important for all of us. We're going to put them in the schedule. Perfect. So our last question is, uh, because sports have been postponed, children are not as active as they used to be. Um, they could potentially be gaining unhealthy weight and they're not interested in participating in different um, physical activities. So what would you recommend for that? Well, there's, first of all, um, I would recommend physical activities for, for everybody, whether it's walking or um, I'm sh you can find something that a child will do that's physical in general, um, uh, even whether it's taking a walk. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, that's where diet comes in. I mean, um, this is not the time to, to have a ton of fast food around the house or to be ordering pizza, you know, three, four times a week. I mean, it's easy, but, you know, build in time and build in menus to basically uh, minimize the kinds of things that um, put on weight, like carbohydrates. And, and I would involve the whole family um, to, um, to get involved in meals and in cooking and in creating the diet. Um, and if one night or two nights a week, you're gonna let things go and you're gonna have macaroni and cheese, whatever, fine. But, um, uh, but what you eat and what you order, whether it's online or uh, uh, what you cook, you know, more people are cooking now than ever before and let them participate in those choices and uh and but you may need to limit what kinds of things the kids can eat and what kind of, we all can eat right great thank you so much so it is one o'clock so we've reached the end of our uh session well thanks so a lot i for will me. yeah i will have amy wrap it up here